So now I want to join the fierce debate about whether or not we should try to contact extraterrestrial life or whether we should wait for them to get in touch with us. And the fact that this debate is underway at all is um, a reflection of the fact that uh, there's been this progressive hyperinflation in the mathematics of possibility. Uh, not so long ago, it was possible to think about this abstractly, right? We are in a galaxy that's got lots of stars, and out there, there are lots of galaxies, so it's likely that something is out there. But we've been able to add to the word lots over the last little while. Lots has become millions of stars in the Milky Way. Millions has become billions of stars in the Milky Way. Billions of galaxies have become trillions of galaxies. And therefore, the mathematics of possibility continue to increase. Not so long ago, it was a rare thing. In fact, it was major news when we discovered an exoplanet, a planet beyond our own star system around which there orbited a planet. Now, we've learned that probably every star out there has its own orbiting planetary system, and within that system, there is a friendly zone. There may be water, life may emerge, and so on and so on, which is what makes the Fermi paradox so puzzling. Fermi asked at one point if life is likely teeming in the universe, where are they? They haven't called. Some people think it's a good idea that they haven't called, and we have for many, many years had a project called SETI. We've had representatives of SETI on this stage, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. It's a passive system. We scan the heavens and we hope that we might come upon a signal. After, I don't know, is it 50 years, Douglas? Nobody has turned up. METI, METI is the proactive system, the system of sending a message to a particular place in the hope that we might alert the alien to our presence. Not everybody thinks that's a good idea. <laughs> Elon Musk doesn't think it's a good idea. Hawking doesn't think it's a good idea. He made the point that the analogy might be to the Europeans arriving on the North American continent, and that didn't turn out so well for the indigenous inhabitants. So arguing for the affirmative is Douglas Vakosh. Douglas, come on out here. Good of you to come. Thank you for having me. And arguing for the negative is David Brin. Now, David's got his mind in the stars, but he neglected to check the dates on his passport. <laughs> <laughs> so. He never made it past Washington, D.C. He took the hop to Washington. He was supposed to get on the Air Canada plane. And that's when they said, uh, 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 not so fast. So he'll be coming to us. There he is on Skype. How are you? Hello, David. So Hello, these guys. are the rules of the engagement. Douglas will argue for the affirmative. 10 minutes. David will have 10 minutes to oppose and rebut and then we might have a little conversation. Away you go. Thank you very much for the invitation. As Moses said, uh, I'll be arguing for METI, why should we should be messaging, but I'd like to do this in a context of a brief history of our attempt to make contact with other civilizations. Uh, and uh, as I do so, uh, telling that story, there's another story underneath that I'd like you to be thinking about, because I think it has broader applications for all of your lives, even if you're not searching for extraterrestrials. And that's the importance of continually looking at the assumptions that drive our actions, and if it turns out that those assumptions are not warranted, being willing to change course. Now, the main story that I want to tell uh, starts in 1960, in Green Bank, West Virginia, where a young astronomer named Frank Drake uh, used an 85-foot telescope uh, to look for signals, radio signals, from two nearby stars, sun-like stars, Tau Ceti and Epsilon Aridne, 
uh, with the hope that over the course of the 150 hours he had allocated to his use, he would able, be able to find another technology comparable to ours sending us intentional signals. Well, he didn't succeed in that, but he did succeed, first of all, in showing that there are not civilizations everywhere transmitting, but even more importantly, he set the precedent for how SETI would proceed over the next 40 years. Uh, and that is to use radio technology. Radio is beautiful because it travels at the speed of light. Uh, and it also uh, cuts through uh, the cosmos uh, with minimal absorption. There are bands that are not absorbed by our atmosphere. There's not a lot of cosmic background radiation. And so for, for four decades, the SETI community said, radio is the way to go. It wasn't until the late 1990s uh, that people heeded uh, 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 an idea that Charles Towns, who invented the laser uh, and got a Nobel Prize for it in the early 1960s, had been saying for decades, which is, well, you know, we could use lasers as well. And that had been scoffed at for many years because people said no one could do that. And then as uh, the uh, time rolled around and it, it came to be the 90s, we realized, wait, we have the ability to do that as well. Uh, and, and so what the SETI scientists did is what any good investment portfolio advisor would uh, encourage you to do is diversify your strategies. And that holds for scientific research strategies as well. And so over the last 15 years, we've also had a robust development of optical SETI, looking for signals in optical range of the spectrum. Well, today I would like to propose that we expand in an even more radical fashion and not just listen, but begin transmitting signals. Well, what do I mean concretely? Let me give you an example. Uh, the world's largest radio telescope uh, is in Arecibo, Puerto Rico, uh, radio telescope. Uh, and in addition to looking at uh, information, radio signals coming in from space. It can also transmit um, radar signals, radio signals used to plot the trajectories of asteroids. That's one of the major purposes for it. Well, in 1974, a symbolic message was transmitted, and you can see it uh, in the upper right-hand corner. It was a very brief message uh, showing some images, scientific information that we hope any extraterrestrials will understand. And it was targeted at a cluster of stars called M13, 25,000 light years away. Well, the general principles, I would argue, are what we should be doing, but we should modify that approach in two fundamental ways. First of all, the 1974 message was a one-off effort, and we should instead be sending repeated messages into space, because when we're searching for signals in SETI, if we see something that looks good once, you know, it's not compelling. Science demands replication, and so we should be transmitting repeatedly uh, in our METI transmissions. And then secondly, we should be transmitting to targets closer to home. So instead of sending a signal to a globular cluster 25,000 years from now, where the earliest we could hear reply back is 50,000 years, we should be transmitting to stars in our own neighborhood, where you know it could still take a decade or two at best, but within a person's lifetime, if you're young enough, you may actually get to test your hypothesis. And so this is an example of a sampling of stars. There are always stars up and close by from Arecibo that could be targeted. There are windows of opportunity where they can't do asteroid studies. It'd be very easy, quick and dirty to do this kind of a project. So that's the sort of thing that I'm advocating as, as an initial start. Now, as Moses said, this is a controversial topic. And when someone as brilliant as Stephen Hawking says, whatever you do, don't transmit to the aliens, you know, you got to think about it. But as Moses also said, there is so much that we have learned in just the last few years about exoplanets that are out there. So it was 2010 when Hawking said, don't transmit because they might come to Earth and strip mine our planet for its rare resources. Well, in 2010, we knew that there were big Jupiter and Saturn-sized planets, but we didn't know that there were rocky planets. So the economic motivation that he was suggesting doesn't hold. But again, you know, he's, he's brilliant, but he can't predict the future any better than the rest of us can. 
But maybe that isn't the reason they're coming. Maybe they've just had a bad millennium and they want to wipe us out. Well, here's the sad news. If that's true, they can already know we're here. If, if, uh, if I Love Lucy is going to be offensive to them and they're going to obliterate us for it, there's nothing we can do. Uh, and this is one of the points of contention uh, that some of us have in this debate, but let me give you the rationale. So we here uh, on Earth uh, have had radio technology for looking at the stars for, since the 1930s. And if you plot the development over the last few decades and continue that trend only two or three centuries, we, a civilization that's just gotten a start in this game, will be able to make contact, will be able to detect our own level of leakage radiation out to several hundred light years, in just two or three centuries. So any civilization that has the ability to come to Earth to do us harm can already know we're here. So there's no added danger. But then you might also say, well, what's the point? If they know we're already here, why bother? Well, I'd like to give you three reasons. The first is what I call the Canadian hypothesis. Uh, and I, I can't take credit for this. This is actually from a, a dear friend, the late Alan Tuff, a SETI researcher at the University of Toronto. And we were having dinner one night, and he said, you know, Doug, maybe the answer to the Fermi paradox of why they haven't sent us anything is because maybe they're less like Americans and more like Canadians. <laughs> said, Instead of sending just everything and announcing, we're here, and, and that's the Americans, um, that, that instead they're more like Canadians and being more reserved, and they're simply waiting for an invitation. <laughs> so maybe that's the explanation. You know, another uh, ties into the challenges that we have of understanding languages here on Earth. And one of the assumptions that has been at the core of SETI is that there's a universal language that we and extraterrestrials will be able to speak. It's the language of math and science. And it's going to be easy for them to send us the Encyclopedia Galactica because science is like progressing up the side of a mountain. And we've gone up a little ways. But a civilization that's been at this a lot longer than we have has gone up even higher. And so they'll just turn around, look back, and they'll know what to send us that makes sense. A bunch of prime numbers, maybe. Well, I hope so. But I'm not going to count on it. Because even if that's what science is, a progressively better understanding of the universe, maybe they started up the mountain from a different side. Or maybe they're climbing up a different mountain range. And the analogy is their environment is different, their scientific needs are different than ours. And so a civilization that's been around a long time and had a chance to make contact with many other civilizations is in a better position to understand us than we are able to understand them. And then the final possibility I, I want to mention is simply there's been this implicit idea in SETI that if an extraterrestrial civilization has the technology to communicate, they will altruistically do so, as if they're ET out there watching out for us. Well, it's plausible to think that there might be altruism in the universe. We see altruism here, chimpanzees, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. But it's a very different thing to assume that kind of altruism between a species completely unrelated to us. Now, I hope the extraterrestrials are like this bird, putting their wing over us and taking care of us, but I'm not going to count on it. Uh, and so maybe, in fact, the, the way this protocol works for interstellar communication is that the less advanced civilization, the one that has most to gain, is the one that needs to take the initiative. Well, this first half century of doing SETI, we have use a strategy that gives us the possibility of making contact immediately uh, and benefiting ourselves. And you know, that's a strategy that makes a lot of sense for a civilization that is in its technological adolescence. I mean, what better way of characterizing an adolescent civilization than looking out for me right now? But as we think about what we want to be as we move into the next half century and beyond, I would encourage us to think about ways that we can contribute to other civilizations uh, and other future generations of humans. And one way to do that is many. In closing, 
Let me just note that sometimes people talk about interstellar communication as an effort to join the galactic club. The thing I, I always find so strange is that no one ever talks about paying our dues or even submitting an application. And that's what METI does, and it may just be the method that lets us make first contact. Thank you.